This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And joining us this week is our good friend and former professor, uh, composer and professor at Michigan State University, Ricardo Lorenz. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ricardo. Uh, I can't hear you. Can't hear me. Now I can hear you. Oh God. Well, it's great to be here. To be here <laughs> uh so we we have been meaning to have you on for for a long time um and one of the reasons we thought it'd be great to have you on now this week is uh you've got a couple of really interesting projects coming up uh you want to tell us about this uh liaisons project that you're involved in yeah this is a project uh produced put together by a good friend of mine somebody i've collaborated uh on many occasions, his name is Anthony Demar, one of the uh, great champions of um, uh, 20 and 21st century music for piano. And uh, it involves uh, commissionings uh, to about 30 composers, uh, works that are very short homages to the music of Stephen Sondheim. Therefore, the, 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 the title of Liaisons, Reimagining Sondheim from the Piano. So it's it's a great opportunity to see what these composers are, uh, the ones that are out there now, uh, very active. What they uh, how they react, how they respond to the uh, the music of Sondheim, of course, the songs in Sondheim. And and did you have any, you have any kind, of kind, of kind of relationship with Sondheim's music before? Is this? Is, I mean, obviously, yes, this course. isn't something that's totally new to you. No, no, of course, and and um, Anthony uh, would have never uh, asked me asked me if I if I didn't realize that I was I've always been a big admirer of Sondheim, well not always, but since I've had the wonderful chance of singing in the opera uh, choir at Indiana University, uh, due to the fact that I flunked another ensemble, <laughs> and that's. that's uh, IU is very funny. In the university, when, when you don't do well uh, on one semester, and everybody has to take uh, an ensemble every semester, no matter whether you're an undergraduate, whether you're a master's student or a doctoral student, you have to be in an ensemble. And I was always in choir because I loved it. But when I didn't do, uh, I didn't do very well, they would, they would make you take two ensembles the following semester. So in a way, I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, uh, singing the music of Sondheim and Sweeney Todd as a punishment. <laughs> and it was a great punishment. And, and I got so, as you can imagine, I got to really get to know his music really well by not only singing it, but actually acting it on stage at the, at the IU Opera. And getting your throat slit, right? And I did get my throat slit, and I got to eat uh, meat pies, and, which of course were not really human meat, the ones we ate. But <laughs> they, they were, they were some. I, That's I, good I guess to know. They, they were blueberries or something, uh, or, or or something, or cherries, something red that made our, our mouth look. Uh, disgusting, <laughs> disgustingly red. But I tell you, I was I was uh, right away taken by his music. I realized that it was not usual uh, musical theater and, and and in Broadway. It was very special, very sophisticated, and really at the threshold of, of being opera. What, what was so sophisticated? What what in particular drew you to it? Well, first the type of story that he he uh, he likes, and in particular Sweeney Todd has a very dark story and um, I read quite a bit afterwards about it uh, and you can take it as a comment to the whole Watergate uh, the whole corruption around Watergate because it came out right after Watergate so I was taken by the fact that this is not lovey-dovey uh, you know sing-along music uh, not that all Broadway music is like that but um, that first and then um, harmonically he's very he's very interesting constantly shifting and uh, and constantly uh, modulating, and rhythmically is very interesting. I remember that cho that choir, uh, that uh, scene where we're all uh, celebrating the, the meat pies of Mrs. Lovett. Uh, it's there's these. Uh, this is it's a five eight, and then it's followed by a seven eight. So also uh, the the uh, the use of meter is very interesting, in that, particularly in that in that piece. So. And of course, the melodies themselves, they're just unique. The textures, which obviously have a lot to do with whoever orchestrates his, his uh, musicals, which is not who is 
you know, he's not the one that does that. Right. Right. But he gets somebody really good to orchestrate his. The combination just, uh, um, you know, was very attracting, attra attractive to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ricardo, could you turn down your speakers just a tiny bit? We're getting a, a little bit of feedback. There, is that better? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that's better. Um, okay. So, and and you got to pick, I assume, in this uh, liaisons project, you know, any, anything from all of Stephen Sondheim's, you know, complete catalog, um, and and you you went with a couple of pieces from Sweeney Todd. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about your your piece in particular? Well, you know, I remember when when uh, Tony Demar uh, called me to to ask me if I was interested. He was not finished with the proposal uh, when I already knew exactly which 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 musical I wanted to deal with, uh, Sweeney Todd, and also I was pretty sure right away what songs. And my my fear was that everybody would have chosen those, and, and they didn't for some reason. Uh, so, but I, I knew right away that I wanted to do something with um, yeah, the, the scene of Mrs. Lovett, uh, Mrs. Lovett's uh, meat pie when we first meet Mrs. Lovett. Um, and um, I chose uh, the worst pies in London. And I actually merged it, I fused it with another great song in that the end of the first act, and that is uh, Little Priest. But I knew right away I wanted to do something with, with those two and. And it worked out because nobody had uh, had chosen those. That's great. Uh, so it, has this has this been performed yet at all? Or is yes. This the first. You know, as you can imagine, there's 30 pieces, so he can't perform them all in the same program. He or eventually <gasps> do a marathon performance where he would do all of them. But what he has done is designed several programs. Each of them has about 17 pieces. So he has done uh, the my reimagination a couple of times one at the van cliburn in texas the van cliburn uh, piano series and uh, another time north uh up upstate new york somewhere near albany and um and as far as i know the next time that he's going to be doing it is, is now in new york city at symphony space on saturday all right so that's 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 next saturday april 21st as we're yeah. recording this yeah uh, Symphony Space in New York. What time is that? That is at oh, that's a good question. It's eight o'clock. Okay, it's, all right. Yeah. So if you're in in New York City area, you should check this out. There's a lot of really really great composers on this program. Uh, in in addition to Ricardo Lorenz, there's, there's a whole slew of pieces. Looking down this this program is uh, just kind of a who's who of who's doing really interesting things. Uh, in in art music right now, we've got Mason Bates, Bill Wolcom, Kenji Bunch, Ricky Ian Gordon, uh, Fred Hirsch. So all different kinds of composers too. Tanya Leon. Uh, so a, a lot of a lot of great composers. Um, have you heard any of these other pieces by chance? There, there's there's a couple of them. Actually, three of them. They're they're in uh, embedded in the website of Leah Songs. And in fact, uh, before I was one of the last composers write this piece because I mean, it was a complicated uh, project to put together because the money uh, for each of those pieces came from all different places. It didn't come from just one, one funding source. So they had to go out and first uh, choose the composer, invite the composer, and once they, they accept it, then they had to go out there and find matches for funding. Mm. So in my matching didn't come until this past um, November, uh, this past uh, September, this past fall. So, um, I, I, I was uh, one of the last ones to, to come in and, 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 and I had the advantage that I could hear, uh, going to your question, I could hear some of these through the website. And it was uh, very good because um, it made me think that there was something I could, I could um, contribute to, uh, to the ones I heard, something that would be a little bit different. I wanted something that had a great deal of character, very upbeat, because the ones I heard were mellower and they were more faithful to the original sound of Sondheim, and I wanted to do something very different than that. So it did help me to the fact that there were at least four examples in the, in the website. So, so you listened to them and decided that you didn't want to do anything like any of those? 
<laughs> as opposed exactly. to I, making I something that fit something... in with them, you made something that contrasted with them. Exactly. I wanted to do something that was extremely rhythmical uh, and and um, very straightforward. And what I ended up doing was a smorgasbord of of um, Afro-Cuban, South American uh, uh, grooves uh, where you could still very clearly hear the melodies of Sondheim of those two, those two songs. And, and just to make it quirkier and almost tongue in cheek, I didn't, I called the, my reimagination the words empanadas in London. <laughs> That's nice. And, and I, I consulted with, uh, I consulted with uh, uh, Anthony with Rachel Colbert, the other producer, to make sure that this was not offensive. <laughs> they said, no, <laughs> we think it's great. I, uh, and uh, so we'll see what Mr. Sonheim will think. Oh, that's Which, right. He's going to be there. He's going to be there. He's going to he's gonna be interviewed. And then there's some panel, composer panel discussions. And, and afterwards, he's inviting the composers to a party wow. that he's throwing. He's throwing for the composers. Wow. That's pretty cool. So how, how do you feel about that? That your your reimagining of his work is going to be performed for him, and then he's going to talk about it afterwards. It's crazy. It's, uh, it would make me a little nervous. I think. Very well, especially when when I am doing something that is tongue in cheek that could be interpreted as though I I am making fun uh, not only of his music but of the Latin Amer the Latino culture. You know. <laughs> so, yeah. but. But uh, that's what we're here for, I guess, to make people think. Uh, obviously, I'm not doing either of those. Right. Uh, and I, I mean, there's, there's, there, there's, there's room for that. There's room for, for interpreting Sondheim's music, but with uh, these wonderful Latin grooves, and um, and and um, and it's true that we don't call uh, pies pies in Latin America. We call them empanadas. <laughs> Yeah, this the small, yeah, right. That's that's great. Do um, you guys have any questions about this liaisons project? No, I can't wait to to hear a recording of the piece though. Yeah, it sounds really cool. Um, it, you had another cool project that you told me about uh, the last time I saw you, and that's coming up in May. Um, and this is at the what is it the the Iberian and Latin American Music Society uh, in the UK. Uh, this this piece is on their on their website under a program called Latin America's Art Music, a simultaneous expression of reverence and irreverence toward the West. And that that sounds that, that sounds like quintessentially Ricardo to me, knowing you the the simultaneous <laughs> reverence and irreverence. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it is actually that that's uh, a talk that I'm offering there before the concert. Oh, okay. So what is this? What is this? This piece that's this going on, or what's this whole project about? I guess. Well, the I, I tell you, until they contacted me uh, last fall, I had no idea that they existed. Uh, uh, it's called the the as you said it, the Iberian and Latin American Music Society in London, and this is a a group of um, of, of musicians and music sponsors that that's what they do. They sponsor concerts uh, of repertoire from Spain, Portugal, and Latin America. And they have um, a modest funding, but they do pretty well with what they have. And they have very, very uh, big names in their board. And um, they had this idea of putting a survey concert of Latin America, which is something that a lot of people like to do. This one with the theme of, of um, they call it revolution. Right, all right. Pieces that that uh, somehow, um, yeah, had a had an irreverence towards uh, classical music and towards the West. However, I pointed out to them right away that uh, that in every single piece that a, a non-Western composer writes, there is also a component of great reverence towards the repertoire. Right. I mean, just using an orchestra. Exactly. Just using a string quartet or. Yeah. So they thought that was very really interesting. So and they, and they of course they have read what I, what I've written about this issue of Latin America's uh, marginalization within the canon of classical music. So then they invited to also give a talk. But the, I think cooler than that is the project that they 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 had envisioned. They thought, 
why don't we ask Ricardo Lorenz to compose a piece as an homage to uh, uh, these, this modality of protests that are very common in Latin America, and that is that you protest by banging pots and pans. I don't know mm -hmm. if you, you guys have ever heard that. Uh, this, it's not something that I was familiar with. Yeah, uh, and, and we're very familiar. This, this started back uh, in during the, the Chilean uprises and dictatorship in the 70s. And, and it started by women, which is something that's very interesting. I mean, no man would have thought of banging on, on kitchen utensils, which is something that women thought of because that was their instrument. So I, I, I use some of that component, and, and, and um, they also requested that uh, the, it's a piece for choir, percussion, and chamber ensemble. They requested that the choir play pots and pans, and the audience participate play pots and pans. <laughs> so, so we'll see what happens. But um, it's it's very uh, very unique, uh, uh, and I thought it, it's a lot it takes a lot of uh, courage to commission a piece that has that that as a theme. Uh, of yeah. course, there was you know there's no text. I, I went out there to see if I could find textbooks because it has choir, a text that would uh, uh, pay tribute to uh, the pot banging protest, but there was none, so I had to commission it from a poet friend of mine, and it was, it was a great, great uh, collaboration, great process, almost as, as fun as writing the piece itself. It's uh, also bilingual because I thought that um, if we we're talking about protests these days, well, there's a lot of them going on. In the U.S., with all this uh, um, uh, uh, protests against Wall Street and so on, so I, I wanted right. to make sure that they didn't think that the protests went only are, are only going on in the Middle East and in Latin America, but the U.S. the U.S. now has a lot of that as well. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious about the the audience participation. I I, I have no yeah, me, idea me what too. that could possibly what that could possibly mean. Yeah, me too. But but I think I think uh, I figure it out. Um, well, uh, this was all ideas that came from the from from them. They right. just threw it at me, and I had to sort of engineer it for right. them. Uh, but in essence, what they told me is that they 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 bought thirty little pots and pans, <laughs> and they're gonna give it to the audience as they come in as a souvenir. Interesting. And with with spoons or something like that. And at a certain point, they wanted they wanted the peas. Uh, to be able to include the audience actually banging on these pots and pans. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, risky, very risky as well. Did you tell uh, me at one point, in, am I, or am I misremembering this, that there's also a rapper, or is that not there well, anymore? You know, I thought, okay, they want audience participation. Uh, for that to happen in an organic way, there has to be a linchpin between what's happening on stage and what's happening in you know, what could happen with the audience. And and it was not going to cut it with the conductor conducting because it, it requires a conductor because there's a degree of sophistication of the piece. And, you know, suddenly the conductor turning around and cueing the audience. Yeah. So I thought, no, we need we need a, a linchpin. And I thought, what better than uh, sort of a street wise kind of a, a, a character uh, they would incite slowly as the piece starts to unfold. It would slowly incite the audience to 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 uh, play the pots and pans or even sing because there's at the end there's a riff that's kind of sim simple for the audience to imitate. And I thought it has to be a rapper. And uh, guess what? Uh, I actually worked with uh, the son of somebody you know very well, uh, Rafael Jimenez, my colleague, who <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. former. Uh, uh, former um, associate director of orchestras here, here at MSU, who's now in Oberlin, but his son is an awesome ra rapper, extremely talented. Really? Cool. Yeah. So what I did is I I uh, I told him about the idea. I gave him the text that I had commissioned, and once I finished the the piece, and once I I had an idea where these moments of rapping should come out, I gave him a, a MIDI recording, and I said, here, here's 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 where I would like rapping to be and here's the text so fire yourself and, and do something he came out with something phenomenal i wish i could play it for you it's just great so what i'm gonna do is actually transcribe exactly what he did in the score which is really very sophisticated rapping mm -hmm. uh and of course in in london 
he can't, he won't be able to, to go there because he can't pay his way there. I can't pay his way there. There's going to be somebody else doing it, and that's going to be interesting how that's going to translate. But eventually, mm. in the score, there's going to be the actual rapping transcribed in it. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's very interesting. Have you ever tried anything like that before? No, I, I mean, I've tried crazy things like a concerto for, for maracas and <laughs> a concerto for Latin band and orchestra, and uh, but nothing with a rapper. But I think I tell you, there's so much potential when, when, I, when I finally heard what he did and how, how inviting yet sophisticated it is. Now I want to do something longer just for rapper and ensemble. Yeah. And actually work with him. You can just do concerto for, for a rapper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, something you know, our cantata. Or yeah, but but definitely, I tell you, it has immense potential, especially when you work with somebody like him, who has grown up with a great deal of classical music. Although he's not a classical musician, he's a he's a you know, twenty year old like anybody else studying in college who who uh, works with another. In fact, it works with our neighbor here, the son of our neighbor. They have a duo, and you can check them out on the internet. Uh, and they're just phenomenally, phenomenally uh, talented in, in, in hip hop and rapping. And but 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 they they have they they are informed by all the classical music they have absorbed through uh, Daniel's father, Rafael Jimenez, who's always conducting a symphony. That's that's very cool. Yeah, I look forward to hearing some of that. So so they don't live together anymore. These these two people and they work together over the web. Who? The, these you said Rafael's son works with this this other guy. No, they actually no. Oh, okay. They both live in East Lansing, and oh, cool. they're very good friends. They went to high school together. But you can hear them. You can hear what they do in the internet. Okay, that's and great. I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you a link because uh, I was blown away the first time uh, I yes, heard it. Yes, definitely send us that link. We'll put it in do our they, show notes. Do they have a group name, or do they? Do you know what name they perform they, under, or record under, or whatever? They do. They do. And I, I right now escapes me. But uh, okay. once I'll send you the link, it's it's there and. and uh, and if you look, if you look under their names, you, you you'll get you'll get to that side. And they have some amazing covers. They have some covers from these. You know, these days rapping is is at a speed that you know I can't fathom. It's just amazing. And and he has a cover that has attracted a lot, uh, attracted a lot of people. A lot of people got have, have gone uh, back to say that Daniel does it better than the original. <laughs> nice. And I, I attribute that to the fact that he. Those, he's bilingual, and there's something about Spanish that allows you to speak extremely fast and very percussively. I think, uh, and there might be something of that that, that he has that extra articulation. <laughs> yeah. Due, due to his knowledge and his speaking of Spanish. That's really interesting. Yeah, it is. Well, Spanish, I think, has the potential to be, um, uh, well, can be more interesting than English rhythmically a lot of the time, anyway. Well, and in combination, uh, 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 in combination is where it gets even more interesting because mm -hmm. you 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 have a lot of consonants in in English, and then you have a lot of um, a heart vowels in Spanish. Mm -hmm. and if you, if, so those people like Daniel, they can rap bilingually. It's really uh, amazing what they come up with. Yeah, that's very cool. And 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 the rap that that I'm using, in fact, the text of of this piece, uh, which by the way is called. Cacerola soul, the soul of the frying pan. Cacerola is frying pan. <laughs> the text is, is bilingual. In fact, the title, as you can by now uh, gather, is bilingual. Cacerola soul. Cool. That's very interesting. Uh, and that's going on in May. What's the What's the date for that? People that's that are May, in London. That's May May third, seven thirty, and at the Purcell Room, which is in the South Bank, where you know the Queen Elizabeth Hall is, and all those major halls there. So I'm very excited. That's very exciting. Uh, you'll have to let us know how that goes. I'm very curious uh, about this piece. We know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It could be great. It can be disastrous, and, and anywhere in between. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. I'm sure. Great. It'll be thank great. you. <laughs> Um, so I, I think we should maybe move into our stories. It kind of segues nicely. We were talking about listening to, um, these, these artists, uh, friends of yours on, on the web. Um, one, one great tool for that. And it's not brand new, but it's, it's relatively new the last couple of years. Uh, soundcloud.com. Um, it was a really interesting article, uh, kind of just a, 
mostly a how-to and why it's important by Mark Wiedenbaum on New Music Box this week about SoundCloud. A public um, service announcement. Yeah, this is essentially a public service announcement that we're repeating. Um, you've used this a lot, right, Sam? I haven't used it a lot, but I've looked at it a lot. Yeah. So I, I, and- I set up an account for it this week when we were doing this, and I saw it was going to be in the rundown. Um, it's not something that I've used a lot before because I've had my own website, but it's like YouTube uh, for audio in, in that it has its own community. So I can put, we put video on the sound notion website. Um, but we also put it on YouTube because there's a lot of people that like consuming video through that community. And there's a lot of, uh, community engagement through comments and everything. And there's a very similar system at SoundCloud. Um, you can, you can put up, uh, up to, for the free account, up to 120 minutes of audio, um and you can upload it in just about any audio format and the i really like the in time comments that you can do so you can comment on a particular point in the audio timeline um be like that was awesome yeah (laughs) so you can or like if you want to mark a spot that you want to make dave play during the pick of the week (laughs) you mark it in their in the soundcloud so you don't forget it right I see. The things I've seen that I like are like this little slice is a sample from this link. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, to me, this is sort of just a review of what makes a good social media site in in part, and then what makes a good social media site that focuses on audio. And like all the stuff in here, you could you could put you know so, change SoundCloud with any other kind of uh, service. And, you know, say these are the reasons why this social media service would be good, and it doesn't matter if it's this or that or anything else. Right. Um, it's cool because you can embed individual tracks. And yes. the one clear thing that he puts in there so that I think— So embed in another web page is like a YouTube video. Right. And he, he, he goes out of his way to point out it's not—he contrasts it to MySpace music, which MySpace music is sort of an old media— uh, it's an old media template in a way because you're trying to make your beautifully designed MySpace page and get people to come there, you know, and look at your content. Whereas this is sort of an infrastructure for the ability to communicate and share, communicate about and share music in a, in a really easy fashion. It's not about getting people to come to SoundCloud and, uh, you know, experience SoundCloud as a website. It's about making a set of tools that people use. And then, you know, of course... SoundCloud is still going to figure out ways to put advertising and, well, I don't guess they use advertising, but they're still going to charge you for how much, uh, you know, space you need to put all your stuff up. Yes. So if you need more than 120 minutes or some other special features, so you can get fancier uh, embeddable players for for external sites and stuff, and and you can they charge you a monthly fee for those things. Um, it's, but they're totally reasonable, and you can get a lot out of 120 minutes of free audio storage. Um, yeah. But it is, as Mark Wiedenbaum points out, um, you get to be a part of this community. You get this kind of your audio files backed up somewhere. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if heaven forbid you're, you're, you lose all of your data on your local machine, you've got these great irreplaceable recordings somewhere that you can get to them. It's also, you know, a way you can encourage collaboration. You can decide whether you want your recordings to, um, be completely protected or you can put them up under creative Commons so that people can t- take them and, and use them for their own projects, which I think is a, is a great thing. It's something that YouTube has started doing as well. Um, you can, you can now check off in a YouTube video that is creative commons. All of the, the videos that we produce for sound notion are creative Commons. So if you want to make a crazy remix of, I, I don't know what you want to do, but if you want to make a meme of, uh, me doing something crazy with my hands, then go for it. Um, I, th- it's... I think, go I ahead, think my favorite thing about the culture of SoundCloud is the, the like people put up works in progress or like mm-hmm. this week's mix or like this iteration of this piece that I'm working on or whatever. And so you get to see part of that creative process and people can participate and talk back and forth. About it. Yeah. And, and you can, another interesting aspect is there's several different modes you can use to sort of curate things you can have like i'm not sure exactly how it works but you can like have your list of favorites 
uh, you can form groups where people under uh, can you know produce material underneath some sort of uh, context like this is a group about drum and bass or whatever you know so you can curate um, different groups of tracks and or people based on certain criteria and those are naturally going to attract people who are That's interested in that kind of stuff I didn't I didn't know that about the the groups as much that's you yeah know, that reminds me of is Flickr that's a very mm -hmm. Flickr thing is to have groups of people that make like-minded things that can then kind of inspire one another. Uh, well, to me, it's it makes sense because, like, think about the things that you can do on this type of networked platform, and that's one of the most obvious, duh, things that you could do. So why wouldn't you do it, you know? Matt Shandorf in chat points out that somebody actually did make a meme of me doing something crazy with my hands that, that I true. forgotten about. Um, I didn't. <laughs> that, so... That's 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 totally something that that our Creative Commons license makes at least legal. <laughs> if not, I didn't for it. <laughs> no, I think it's in great taste. Thank you. I, I think it was. I think he's right. I think it was Griffin Candy that made that. So, Griffin, if you're listening, I appreciate it. Um, anybody... Yeah. So if you're in the market for an easy to use uh, audio application that lets you spread your music around and find like-minded people who might be interested in your music, SoundCloud is a good way to go. Yeah. So uh, we, we have a couple of kind of quick headline-type stories. Uh, the uh, tw 2012 Guggenheim Fellows were announced this past week. Ten of them are composers, so uh, congratulations to them. Uh, they they are Tom Cipullo, Fang Man, Vivian Fung, Darren Hagen, Huck Hodge, Carol Macon, Alex Minchik, Bobby Previtt, Kate Soper, and Zhao Gang Ye. So congratulations to those 10 people. Uh, and we look forward to seeing the work that they create uh, with their Guggenheim Fellowships. Uh, also, Ethel has a, a new album out this this week. or Is it, is it out this week? For the first April twelve is the uh... yeah. So it was just just released a few days ago, just yeah. this past Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Um, so you should check it out. It's by it's called Heavy. Uh, Ethel's of course a very very hip young uh, string quartet. Uh, or heavy, you might say. Formed in two thousand six. Sure. Yeah. So so they're they're making the 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 cool new sounds. Um, bunch of they came uh, to MSU. They must have been brand new when they came then. Mm-hmm. Bunch of hip New York composers on, on released this, on, on this Innova album. Recordings, and that's something worth pointing out. It's all new works, but they're all New York composers. The cruel <laughs> reign of terror, uh, New York's cruel reign of terror over new music continues. <laughs> uh, that's our headline. <laughs> that's our headline. That's, Ricardo, if you don't watch the show a lot, that's one of my pet peeves. That anytime I can uh, make a point about it, I try to. The, or, what, the the the, the there, hegemony of New York City. Yes, music yeah. is written in other places besides New York. Even yeah. cool music. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I I told you that I when I uh, had the fortune of being at the McDowell Colony, I was uh, amazed that maybe sixty percent of the fellows were from New York City. And, wow. And and the yeah, so and not only in music, of course, uh, novel writing and filmmaking, uh, and theater and even puppetry, everything. It's it's really a lot of them were from. So it makes me it makes me wonder. Yeah. Is, there, is there something special in the water there, or are they the only people that are interested <laughs> in McDowell? I don't. Well, it, it, it for for one is close, uh, and uh, in fact, the history of McDowell started with uh, uh, Edward McDowell uh, uh, escaping New York City to to go out there to <sighs> to New England uh, to compose. So I guess uh, historically it makes sense for a lot of them to be from New York City, and geographically it makes sense. Right. But I yeah. tell you, if, if, I'm sorry if anybody from New York City is uh, listening. Uh, um, uh, they're so pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, just bluntly. They have a reason to, to be phenomenal city, but I wish they would. Well, we'll, we'll get our, unfortunately, our New York correspondent is not here today. Yeah. To defend been... the, right. the, we the city of New York. Too. Would have gotten the inside scoop. Yeah. So, uh, in, in a, a, another quick story, there is a third grade romance unfolding in <laughs> the Louisville Orchestra. Uh, like, when I was reading, I don't understand about, what's going on. 
when I was reading about what's going on, I was having flashbacks to those notes like check this box if you like me kind of stuff going on, you know. Um, so I didn't I didn't study too hard about it because I'd rather just wait until we have Drew on the show and he can tell me the story. From yeah, the we'll have to have Drew McManus <laughs> uh, of Adaptation on the show again sometime because he's he's the one that always sets us straight with what's going on in in orchestra business. Um, but it seems like. So last week we said the Louisville Orchestra has decided they're basically disbanding their professional orchestra and hiring a bunch of Cabs. amateurs, uh, non-union musicians, to fill out a small part-time orchestra uh, because they're they're and they're giving up on negotiations. And that was last week. Now this week, the Louisville Orchestra musicians said, "Hey, we're really close to a one-year bridge deal, and then we'll, we'll during that year we'll make another deal for the future." and the Louisville Orchestra said, "We don't know what you're talking about. There's no. Ne- we haven't talked to you since November. We haven't sat down and negotiated since November." And and the musicians said, "Uh huh." <laughs> <laughs> and so so I don't know what really what's going on. Uh, it seems to me that uh, maybe the Louisville Orchestra musicians are just like I don't know trying to put some pressure on 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 the the orchestra management somehow i don't really understand what's going on but it's weird and will it'll hopefully clear up in the next few weeks times are tough in louisville Moving times on. are tough in louisville but they're also <laughs> tough in places where they have uh a, a, even more uh prestige the minnesota orchestra uh is is in uh the, the is in trouble as well. They're about to uh, go into their own uh, negotiations with musicians, and their budget is continually getting slashed in in a big way f- by the state. Um, and it's I think this, unlike most of the orchestra stories that we talk about, which I don't feel like have much to do with, um, you know, new music new at music. all. The, Min- the Minnesota Orchestra actually kind yes. of does have something to do with new music. They play a lot of contemporary music and that's, that's kind of uh, their their big claim to fame. Um, so uh, we don't yeah, really have any, any discussion here other than to, to point out that uh, this is a, a growing problem and it's even affecting you know, one of the things we say is well, they're, they're old because they're playing all that old crap. Well, these guys are playing new stuff and they still have problems. If Once I can if, go if for I it, can, yeah. If I can uh, contribute to the to, to this uh, n- uh, news, um, you know, I had uh, the experience of being very close to the Chicago Symphony for at least six years, uh, and um, I got to work with a lot of the administrators there, a lot of departments, and something that I never understood in this. It's, same case with every single orchestra, whether it's first tier, second tier, or third tier, is that they're supposed to be, they are non-for-profit organizations, but within the administration, uh, they they behave as though these were corporations. And, and uh, that discrepancy between being officially non-for-profit, but mentally, psychologically, a corporation is what I think gets in the way, and that's where also issues with unions uh, uh, come about. Uh, I think it's time that these orchestras realize, uh, you know, either we are going to behave as corporations, that we are corporations, they're, they, and we make money, and money is an issue is an issue for us, or the most important issue, or they say we are non-for-profits and we're going to behave like non-for-profit foundations. Yeah, but I, I also feel like there has to be some model under which they can make money and still create an interesting and... Uh, but but then they shouldn't be in, they shouldn't product. be that then they shouldn't be uh, they shouldn't label themselves as, as non for profit sure that's, that's... sure and, and 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 in doing that they would also you know forfeit all of their their government grants and such um, so exactly yeah with well, that, that, that that's the thing it's a but tricky if, situation yeah uh, but I I I was uh, I was surprised and shocked by it by the fact that I finally was close to an orchestra. I just didn't understand why these these people wearing suits like they were business people. <laughs> Most of these people that work in the administration are used to be musicians, and right. So, so uh, I wish they would behave more like that, uh, and uh, rather than than corporate uh, um, corporate executives. Yeah. Well. I mean, well, in the discussion of how orchestras and or operas are gonna, you know, go forward. Um, 
I think that uh, the Seattle Opera has put forth what I, to me, and I'd like to preface this by saying I don't know if there are other opera companies or orchestras doing this kind of thing. I found this story and thought it was very interesting. Seattle Opera is doing a uh, free simulcast in an 8,000-seat arena of uh, an opera that the opera house itself will hold 2,000 people, up to 2,000. This The simulcast is free at this big arena. To me, this is a much more credible idea as making a sustainable model for an orchestra going forward than, um, whoa, you know. Whoa, 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 time out. It's, that's sustainable? Yeah. To, 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 to have this <laughs> video production streamed live to the thing down the street for free? How well, is that sustainable? I said not necessarily free, and I didn't say it was exactly what we're going to do. I well, said it's a much more manageable or much more sustainable model. No, I, 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 I see where Sam, I think I know where Sam is going with this. Uh, I, an example of the same idea of, of broadcasting uh, a live concert in big video screens to uh, public who are not paying is what the uh, New World Symphony is doing. They have, as you know, they yeah. have a brand new hall. And as I understand, they broadcast their concerts outside of the hall. On the side of the screen. building. Mm -hmm. Outside of the building. And uh, they're, as far as I've been able to read and talk to people, their idea is that you, you then uh, are catering to future patrons. So they, yeah, see right. it, they see it first on a big video screen, and they, and they may think, wow, this is cool out here. Imagine how it would be inside. And apparently... That's uh, that's where they're going with this. They're, they're trying to allure. It's almost like you know, a, a little hook, a, a bait that they're giving to prospective new patrons of the orchestra. It's, it's, we'll see whether it works. Live right. streaming is the gateway drug. There you go. So right. they're they're doing this. Their their first time doing this, I suppose, is going to be uh, May fifth at uh, at Key Arena in in Seattle, and they're they're doing. Uh, Madam Butterfly, and I'm not sure if I would have picked Madam Butterfly for this performance. Uh, I, was, I was telling these guys before the show, Madam Butterfly is the first opera that I ever saw, and it's also the first opera that I ever fell asleep in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very long, and I'm not sure it's that interesting, but I, I suppose other people feel very differently about it. But it's, it Puccini. It's, 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 but, it's but, Puccini. It's Puccini. But but if you're good, there's a lot. I, I like Puccini. I just don't like this one yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right um but what what inspired me to say it's a more sustainable model is they're not charging right now and it's kind of uh it suggests to me from reading the article that they're thinking of them as commercials you know to advertise the idea of opera yeah. because as uh, the uh, opera executive director kelly tweedle says uh most people in in uh in uh, Seattle probably haven't even seen an opera, so they have no idea whether or not they're going to get any value for their money in buying a ticket. However, I think they would be better off. Like, think about the uh, what you have to do to go to an opera. If you're going to pay the price and go to one of the 2,000 seats that's inside the opera hall, you're obligated to dress up. You can't bring your kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's an 8,000-seat arena, and you're probably not going to have 8,000 people there, which means there's plenty of room for people to move around, and you can have concessions, and there's not too long a line at the bathroom. You know, charge ticket prices that are very low and reasonable for that, and I think you'd have a better chance at making something sustainable than using this as five commercials and then stop doing this and hope people start showing up to the 2,000-seat arena. Yeah. So you're, so, so you're right. saying that, that, that the... the the best idea is to continue this to make it uh absolutely absolutely people people among all the things that people have a chance to absorb that's in the realm of you know music um certainly we think that madam butterfly deserves a certain kind of respect but i doubt average citizens in seattle think that it's just one of the other things they have to pick from um so making it user friendly on people with families and making it not too expensive and you yeah. don't have to go and put on a tie and all that stuff. That seems like this should be the working model for opera companies. Do this and charge admission to the simulcast. You, you yeah, charge well, admission they, to the live. The, the Met is doing that all around the country as well. Sure. Yeah. But you have to actually, I guess, pay to go to a theater to see it, right? Yeah. yeah. And the, the the those Met Opera streams are really high quality too. Yeah. Um and, and but they they're not cheap either. They cost more than a movie ticket. They're usually, I guess, it depends on the theater, twenty or thirty bucks. 
Um, yeah, and I think but they're they should long. figure out a way. They should figure out a way to probably – well, I don't know. It depends on how long it is and other factors, but they should make them as competitively priced as possible. I, from um, the but from the from the perspective of the theater owner, I mean, they're giving over their theater, which they could be selling tickets to, you know, Iron Man five, uh, instead to Wagner, which takes about as much time as three showings of Iron Man five. So why shouldn't they charge you three times Iron Man five? You know what? What I I haven't understood understood yet why operas don't start doing uh, you know product placement. <laughs> I mean, it would be very easy. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about this. Imagine they're showing that big screen and doing Madame Butterfly, but you know, in the middle of that aria, somebody brings out an iPod and whatever it is, and and everybody sees it in the screen, and there you go. There you have your advertising. It pays for itself. There you go. And everybody's happy. There you go. Product placement for opera. That's my idea. <laughs> I think that's a that's a great idea. I'm and we're gonna pitch that to the to the Metropolitan Opera next week. Right. Especially when no, but save it for when you want to write an opera. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'll just write the opera about iPads and you know whatever movies coming out that week and you know dishwashers and things like that, and then it'll just be in the opera forever, and you can just change it to whatever the current thing yeah. is. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, insert it, soft drink here that right. would say in the score <laughs> exactly exactly i think that's a great idea you know and people who want to pretend that opera is too good for that i mean don't tell me that money and politics and glad handing hasn't always been a part of what opera gets performed and who's in it and who's directing it and all that stuff amen yeah <laughs> so what do you say we uh we uh Flip the flip the schedule a little bit. And what do you say we, we hold off on this Rob Deemer thing for a week and skip it's down to talk. the Will Robin thing since I know Ricardo yeah. has some thoughts on this. Apologies um, to friend of the show, Matt Shandorf, who's been excited about this, but he should uh, stay tuned a, for next week. There's a great we're gonna talk about this article. It's gonna be really interesting. Uh, it's so if you would like to check it out, it's new, on New Music Box, Rob Deemer has put together uh, a list of three pieces that he thinks are are worth including in, it seems like it's including in in an anthology of music history uh, from the 21st century. So he gets, so this whole anthology of music history, he gets to pick three pieces to represent the 21st century, the last 12 years. Um, And it's, it's really interesting. He talks about the process he goes through and all that, and we'll talk about it next week. But right now, uh, we're going to talk about a, a different editorial uh, that was published this week, a uh, blog post by uh, the the inimitable uh, Will Robin. If you don't follow Will Robin on Twitter, seated ovation, <coughs> it's very funny. Uh, you should do that. But he wrote a post this week uh, kind of I, – I wouldn't say he's calling for – I guess he is calling for the United States to have a secretary of culture, a secretary of the arts – comparing the United States to a lot of other governments around the world that have secretaries or ministers of culture and the arts uh, who are kind of in charge of making sure that the arts are thriving in, in, in their countries. And we don't really have a single person uh, who, whose job it is to, to make sure that that's happening in the United States. So, Ricardo, I know you had some very strong feelings about this. You want to you share your opinions? Well... Several, several things. I found it a very interesting article. I'm, I'm glad that you um, sh- shared it with me. Um, you know, I come from a country, I was born in a country that has always had a minister of, of culture. I've known several of the ministers of culture in Venezuela, so I can speak from that point of view. I also, I am married to a German woman, and um, I've been to Germany a lot, so I, 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 did, I understood what he was saying about how Germany... How, the, how much the government, and yes, and the ministry of culture in Germany um, contributes to the culture there. But um, you know, let, let's look at let's look at the the, uh, the cultural influence worldwide of the U.S. without a ministry of culture. I mean, we haven't had a ministry of culture in the U.S., have we? I, I, I remember there. Never. No. Exactly. Yet the U.S. has managed to be, and let's let's face it, the the nation in the world that has had the most international uh, influence uh, culturally in the world. Yeah, it's def- uh, we without, definitely have a hege- hegemony. Yes, and without a minister of culture, without the government, uh, you know, 
uh, saying uh, uh, or promoting the arts. It has, it has happened spontaneously. Um, I remember reading a fantastic, fantastic letter uh, that uh, Copeland wrote to uh, Carlos Chavez when they were in communication and and uh, started by Chavez complaining to uh, Copeland that he, because he had a, a, a position in the cultural ministry back in the 40s in Mexico, he didn't have time to compose and he was so busy doing bureaucratic work uh, for the orchestra or for the city uh, that really his composition had had uh, wind down. And Copeland writes back saying, uh, what are you talking about? You don't know how lucky you are that you can um, help uh, 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 direct the culture in your country. I have none of that here in the U.S. I'm a composer and that's it. And that, that made me think that uh, that for somebody in the U.S., it may seem like a fancy a fantasy and, and something very attractive, but it's not realistic in the U.S. It's never been. And for one, it's because uh, the U.S. is extremely diverse in its culture. I mean, I think uh, uh, it's it's a country where it is most accepting and um, it is uh, most... Um, what's the word, a tolerant of all kinds of, of expressions, not the only the hegemonical ones. And uh, if you think of a minister of culture <coughs> trying to cater to every single expression, and I think it would be pretty impossible. You don't find that in, in Germany. Germany is an extremely heterogeneous society. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Stockhausen in Germany, whether you like him or not, is seen as uh, as uh, inheritor of the Beethoven tradition. That's the way they take it. So it makes sense makes sense there for a ministry a ministry to back up a project of Stockhausen like the one they're about to do in London, because that's everybody assumes that that is their heritage, that that their legacy. Well, what's her legacy here in the U.S.? Uh, all right, is it Tupac? Is it Tupac or is it Copeland? It could be both. And depending on who you're talking about, they will tell you, for me, it's Tupac, for me, and for somebody else, it's Copeland. How does the Minister of Culture decide uh, or, or weigh in uh, uh, that that immense diversity that we have in the U.S.? is my question. Well, that, that might be uh, a uniquely American thing, is to consider that somebody like Tupac might be as valuable to... Uh, the way we define American culture as somebody like uh, this, this article mentioned, Steve Reich. Um, and I, I don't know if, if, if other cultures would, would feel that way. And, and I'm not even sure most Americans would feel that way. You, you well, mean, uh, uh, sorry, to, I, mean, I missed that. The, well, I mean, you, you mentioned Tupac, and, and, and I'm not sure that every every culture in the world would value Tupac and uh, Steve Reich in the same way. No, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm wondering if maybe that's maybe the, the barrier to, to uh, the, the Secretary of Culture is that, uh, like you say, um, we don't we don't uh, kind of discriminate between different types of culture in yeah, be, the U.S. Well, yeah, we, we do. Just, we do? Tell me, Sam. Set yeah, me straight. Tupac would be, you know, on average, Tupac would be held in way more value than Beethoven um, in the United States. I mean, to say to say otherwise, we're talking about all United States citizens on average. It'd be ridiculous to suggest that people are going to find as much value in Beethoven as they do in Tupac. Oh well, um, yeah, but but let, let, let's let's keep let's let's talk about American composers, American artists. So, yeah. so Beethoven wouldn't wouldn't fit the bill. But okay. let's Steve Reich, Steve Reich, for example. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I'm kind of of two minds on this. On the one hand, I think that um, having a minister of culture is a type of centralization that I think we're moving away from as human beings and uh, needing as much. However, like you say, Ricardo, that the American culture is the most, you know, spread the most throughout the world, but the way it's spread is intimately linked with financial systems having to do with media companies um, in a way that I think the goal of the Minister of Culture would be 
to find ways to spread uh, culture that as much as possible divorces itself as, uh, from the idea of it's spreading because it's popular and it generates capital, but it's spread because it's important and it needs to be spread. Yeah, and for that, that's where you have the non-for-profit foundations in the, in the U.S. That I, I, that I don't think there's another nation in the world that has more of those. Uh, so that compensates for the lack of a minister of culture. And I, I personally think that's better. Uh, it, I don't want to appear like I am uh, uh, a proponent of, of free market and free, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, free competitive markets. But I, I've seen both. I've lived under both. I've lived in a country where there's a minister of culture. And uh, and um, I've lived now in the U.S. and I frankly think that the system uh, works. I don't think it needs a minister of culture. I think it needs more creative ways of of uh, of, of fun funneling economical sources to yes, as you say, uh, Sam, to uh, endeavors other than uh, those that make money for a corporation for a record industry. And uh, I mean, for example, I think it would be more interesting to if if uh, the the Internal Revenue Service through the government can say, okay, every single penny that we receive from the arts, let's say all the taxes that that are raised from Hollywood, imagine if that money raised through Hollywood, which is supposed to be the arts, can be poured back into the arts for expressions that are unlike Hollywood don't make money. But somebody I, has to decide who gets the money. Well, that well, then the question is the distribution of that. But I don't think um, uh, the minister of, of uh, the minister of, uh, of, of culture uh, would be the way to do it. It would, I'm sure there would be a, a different way. There would be a pool of money that is actually safe for for the arts, but. Uh, but there will be then then uh, constant uh, sustainable resource of money because there's there's a lot of things we call art which I don't think they're art but they're making money and there's others that don't so I think it's right. just a question of equalizing the landscape. I think uh, there's a lot of value though to having uh, like a, a a figurehead for the arts uh, in in uh, in the country. I think there's a lot of value to um, you know being able to point to somebody and say. You know, it's this person's job to represent the interests of the Minnesota orchestra that, that is struggling. Uh, in, in, in not necessarily to represent the interests of the Minnesota orchestra, but to represent the interests of people in Minneapolis to hear the Minnesota orchestra. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and to represent the interests of the people of Louisville to have their orchestra. Um, and... It's. I think it's. It's. It's valuable for us to have that. That authority figure. Um, if, if any. If anything, symbolically. I mean, yes. Symbolically, yes. Symbolically, yeah, I, I, I think I it's very that. valuable. I get that, uh, and it's true. Uh, if if you have a ministry of uh, of energy, sure, well, there should be somebody also in the government uh, being the spokesperson for the arts. I. I. I that I think. It, is a good idea, a spokesperson for the arts in in the government. Um, now that whether that person behaves as as a funneler of resources uh, or, or or I'm not sure, uh, but but yes, I agree. We should have a spokesperson. Well, I think another thing to consider, and I agree with you in a, in a certain sense, Dave, that having a central figurehead can be helpful. But I also think it could be cause lots of problems because like in the article it talks about having a, uh, a composer laureate and an artist laureate and a director laureate those are symbolic things that don't really mean anything um, and it seems like take the Minnesota Orchestra for instance my guess would be that if you had a, a, a government person um, they would look for government type solutions which usually don't end up very well get very good um, I think it's more beneficial to uh, you know, imagine the Occupy movement. If people in the arts could get more in that mindset where they're going to use their collective voice to have more direct say in the democratic process, but in this case in the artistic 
uh, process, you know, what's, what's given value and what's not. I think that would be more valuable than having a cultural a department of uh, having that guy. A culture czar? A culture czar. A, a, a zart, as he a says z- in the... Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, I, I like that term. You know, I, I like the earlier comment of Sam that we're going towards a decentralizing state and it's more and more, everything is more decentralized. I'm all for decentralization. So if you if that's the way things are going, and we believe in that, uh, I think the idea of a SAR, somebody that is representing the entire culture of one nation, is just um, it, it's illogical. It just doesn't 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 make sense. Right. Yeah. I I and I would agree. I would agree with that. That that that's that's definitely you know incongruous with, with the way we experience culture today in, in a very decentralized way i do think i do think for example the 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 government could do more for example to to uh, um uh promote a, a initiatives like sound notion so not necessarily say uh well we're going to give money to this composer or this artist or this gallery but say let's put money in the endeavors to disseminate all kinds of art right which, right so dissemination is something that i think you can have a star who could you know his job would be or her job would be to you know we're going to try to democratize the dissemination of art and, th- and i think that goes back to your your spokesman yeah exactly right? that, that would be a spokesman's job yeah exactly and and, so, and 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 somebody who who uh opens avenues for all kinds of art to be promoted through the internet through through, through schools through education uh i i think that i find that really interesting but i wouldn't call it a a, a minister of culture it would be something different it's related to the arts and culture but but not as it's it's conceived right. in germany or in mexico or in venezuela I, I think even to 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 me growing up in the u.s the the title minister of culture sounds a little draconian <laughs> it sounds. It like, does. Yeah, I, I think it does. And I tell you, I've, I've met some of those people myself. <laughs> <laughs> Ministers of culture. Well, yes, of course. In fact, uh, if you've been following uh, this big hype about the Venezuelan youth orchestra movement, yeah. there's a name that. In fact, there's a name who's going to get a doctoral, uh, an honorary doctorate next week at the University of Michigan. His name is Jose Antonio Abreu, and he's the the founder of this. Youth Symphony Orchestra movement in Venezuela. He was a Ministry of Culture for a while in Venezuela. It didn't work very well. He realized that he was wasting his time, that he'd rather focus it on one single endeavor, which was this youth orchestra movement. Yeah. And that's what he did. He just he was a Minister of Culture maybe three years. That was about it. And I was yeah. I was very close at when during that time, and I knew him very well then. And uh, also, for, the, the job of a Minister of Culture is uh, difficult to take. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and because it's also you could make the argument that, you know, the the sort of the fact that we should be valuing the arts and figuring out ways to make them enrich the lives of Americans is in the Constitution. You know, it says to provide for the general welfare. It just depends on what you think general welfare is. If you think that artistic vitality is a part of general welfare and you hear people publishing that thought constantly you know it's good for us it makes people creative we get things out of it that are tangentially related you know great discoveries kind of like the difference between pure science and investigative science where pure science will lead to things that have an influence on human culture um so i don't know like we need a centralized figurehead but uh the government should be in the business of more uh, of of more creatively um fostering the arts i just had a thought actually so like i love the idea of doing simulcasts in theaters of opera concerts. So as a way to, uh, to increase the general welfare of the country, how much would it cost to subsidize um, orchestras to give free uh, simulcasts? You know, like pick a whole for, bunch of orchestras and give them the money to simulcast five operas that year. For example, yeah. and that goes that, that goes to the idea of, of helping to disseminate right. any artistic expression. Disseminate it, not no matter what it is that that i think is really really uh important to think about yeah right. how how the government can help yeah. uh in, instead of um uh the, you know what well what the national endowment uh, does which is just 
have a call for grants and that's it. Uh, it has to be um, has to be much more active, but in in a way that that uh, ends up simply making all the arts expressions much more available to anybody anywhere. Yeah, and, and in that way, you're you're not convincing people. Uh, you're, you're you're not forcing people to support the arts, you know, by spending their their tax money, but you're convincing them that they want to support the arts, uh, and you're and you're getting people that that do that on their own by by again disseminating the arts to as many people as as possible and just making them available to everyone. Um, I think that that's that's the key uh, goal here. Yeah, so I think we should uh, wrap this up and move on to the pick of the week. Do you think? Um, it's time. The pick of the week. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so our pick of the week this week is from our guest, Dr. Ricardo Lorenz. Uh, it's it's a piece called El Muro for wind wind ensemble. What do you, what do you how do you describe this? There's not a good word, I guess. Wind symphony. Yeah, well, the the, the score says wind symphony. Yeah. Okay, so uh, or, or actually symph symphonic wind ensemble. Oh, wow. there you go. So, do you want to introduce this piece? then for us oh yes i would love to um el muro is uh, spanish for the wall i was i would say that it's not the wall as in the pink floyd the wall but more uh commentary on the wall fence that has been uh in construction for a while between mexico and the u.s but the piece was written under a commission by the uh uh, American Bandmasters Association and the University of Florida, and um, the I had the the fortune of working uh, very closely with Kevin Sedato, the, the director of bands at, uh, at Michigan State University, and um, eventually the American Bandmasters Association did not do the premiere of this piece because it ended up being a bit too uh, difficult for the level they were intending it to be. And and I was very lucky that it happened because then Kevin Sotto took it upon himself to premiere it at a, talking about dissemination and at perhaps the best place where you can play it when something be heard by people. And that was at the, uh, at the CDBNA at uh, one of the conventions of the, of the um, uh, College Band Directors National Association. And... Um, is that enough? <laughs> the no, that's, good. That's, that's good. Uh, I, do you, so we're going to play uh, just a, a little clip from the beginning. Sam wanted to play later in the piece, <laughs> but I don't want to spoil the ending, and I don't well, want to okay. spoil the, the, the payoff. We can talk about him. That's fine. Well, then you, you need to let me, before we start, express my love to Ricardo about okay. that moment. There, <laughs> I listened to the one moment in your piece like about ten times for the past two days because the payoff is so awesome it's about three it's quarters a, of the way through or so you'd say about nine minutes and eh, the build-up that gets to the point that i really love starts at about nine minutes and uh basically you've been suggesting that we're going to be able to dance to this music the whole time but not really and then finally we can dance i see you mean yeah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you don't overdo it we only get like five seconds of this well you know un unabated dance Kind of thing going on and then it moves on if i if i can just say something without ruining the no the, go for it the sonic ending and this is something no, you can you can explain it i just don't want to play it well, right okay uh, uh and well the, the the what i had in mind was to create a, a sonic wall but uh a wall that would work almost as a mirror of all these musical expressions that come from the south that all those musical expressions that if you put a wall there between the U.S. and Mexico, well, they won't be able to get here because there's a wall. But I thought, what about if this wall is a mirror that that is actually uh, um, where it's actually reflecting all this music? And slowly, this mirror starts being so weighty that it it falls down, it cracks, it, it breaks. So at the end, uh, my idea was to give the impression that this wall breaks, and finally we're able to hear. It. Uh, what's going on on the other side of the wall? I think that's a, a perfect description of what I heard. It's great. It's really, really cool. Great. Um, so we're going to listen to just about a, a minute or so right off the top of this piece. This is uh, El Muro uh, by our guest, Ricardo Lorenz. 
performed by the Michigan State University Wind Symphony. So that was an excerpt from uh, El Muro by our guest Ricardo Lorenz, performed by the Michigan State University Wind Symphony. Uh, thank you f so much for sharing that with us. Oh, a pleasure, uh, David. It's, a, it's a, a really a love. There's some really great orchestration moments in here. Uh, had you written a lot for for band before? No, and I'm glad I had not before um, because uh, I didn't have that wind sound in my head i was thinking more of uh writing for orchestra okay so in, in it feels in a lot of places a little bit like chamber music mm -hmm. yeah and and sometimes my my big ensemble pieces suffer from that they're they're i, I keep wanting to go back to to chamber music because i think it's the most intimate but yeah I, I keep i keep wanting to make these you know big chamber music pieces no, it I, works I, for Mahler. It, it, well, yeah, Mahler has those moments too. Yeah, you're right. No, I mean, I was I was saying that as a compliment. I really think it's a nice thing when when a big orchestra or a big band like that can make a small sound for for yeah. a while. I think it's yeah. it's really cool. It's also great when when one learns how to make it sound huge, yeah, bombastic, and, uh, oh, but but in a unique way. So and you got there too. <laughs> Just yeah, that's, yeah. That's what that's what happens at Sam's favorite part. Yes, <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And. uh I, I guess we mentioned this, but the MSU Wind Symphony just killed that performance. Just killed it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I I I remember I mentioned that uh, uh, there's a very good version out there by the University of North Texas with uh, the famous uh, Eugene Corporon, and that's great too. But uh, I tell you, there's something about the MSU version, and that's live, by the way. Mm -hmm. That, as you say, Sam, it's it's a killer, and I think it was also the fact that I was able to work with them very very closely. And in fact, Kevin Sedato has something to do with that ending because we discussed it. Uh, we discussed it uh, a lot. And earlier, that the end that was not the ending. It was a different ending. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, in talking, once I heard it, and in talking with Kevin and also John Madden, uh, um, I thought, okay, we need to do something different. That's the way we, we end up with this new ending. So someday you'll be able to buy the special edition DVD that has the alternate ending on it, right? That's right. Well, yeah, all, all, all the, <laughs> cause it has, exactly, and it has the original ending, which, in fact, the piece, the, 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 the ending that you're talking about still appears in the piece as an alternate, alternative ending, even though everybody does it that way. Yeah, yeah that's very cool. Um, so you get to so you worked a lot of back and forth with the MSU Wind Symphony. Can a lot, you, and, and what uh, did you learn from that experience? Uh, well, one is when you, when one is doubling too much and when one is not doubling enough, doubling instruments. Uh, you know the the right. Wind Symphony Wind Symphony sometimes suffers from I think from too many doublings, mm -hmm. but at times at times uh, with with the right instruments. They they can help a great deal, uh, the certain section. So I did a lot of that, a little a, a lot of thinning things down after I heard the rehearsals, and then thickening some things up again, as well. Yeah, yeah. Definitely and, a different set of orchestrational challenges. Yes, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed, yeah. Uh, one piece that I credit for sound that I was after is wonderful piece by Michael Colgrass, yeah. uh, Winds of Nawal. That piece for me was a, an ear and eye mind opener. 
yeah it's a, it's a really great piece and anybody that's interested in in writing for wind ensemble should absolutely listen to that piece a lot i agree it's very cool stuff it's and it's a little unusual because it's got some really prominent strings in it too um, uh what do you mean by prominent strings the the well the 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 bass the the string bass i think is really oh. prominent in yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. You're right. Which, which, which is funny because I almost uh, play a trick. I don't use the string bass until the very end, and as you know, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's in that little band at the end. But yeah, but yeah, but you're right. Yeah, he has a very good double bass. Right. That's that's tricky for wind symphony. We have, we have yeah. talked about what do you what do you do with the, the string bass? Or you, the harp you, or the piano or any of those yeah. that get buried really easily. You don't mind? I I, I if I can. Uh, uh, pitch David's uh, concerto for for Pan and the Wind Symphony. No, I, I remember discussing whether you would use a string bass or not, and you you ended up not using it, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, one has to really want to feature it. Uh, yeah. One is going to use it. And if there's no need to feature it, then might as well not use it. Yeah, I agree. So uh, thank you so much for joining us this week, Ricardo. It was a lot of fun talking to you. Been a pleasure, Dave and Nate and Sam. I miss you guys. And as I've told you before, I think Sound Notion is extraordinary, an extraordinary venue for dialoguing and, and, and sharing ideas. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. That means so much to us. Uh, it, for anybody that's listening at home, make sure you check out uh, Ricardo's upcoming performances in New York next Saturday, April 21st at Symphony Space. Uh, with the the liaison Stephen Sondheim project and Anthony Demar, and of course uh, May third in London uh, at uh, London South Bank Center. So uh, check those out for sure, and we'll also have a link to uh, a recording the the North Texas recording of the piece that we listened to today, the University of North Texas Wind Symphony, with Eugene Corporan playing El Muro. Um, so that's going to do it for this week's sound notion so thank you to everyone who who watched live this week we had a, a a lively chat room going in the live stream this week so thanks to everyone there we do stream this show live every sunday around 11 a.m so you can join us in chat and share your opinions with us live um if you missed the live stream, you can still tell us what you thought of our show and our silly ideas at soundnotion.tv slash SN. That's our website. You can also leave us a note on Facebook or Twitter. We're at SoundNotion, and all, all the regular panelists are uh, individually on Twitter as well. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there and subscribe for free to catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gula, who hopefully will be back with us next week, and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching.